Were your parents born in this country? Oh, yeah. yeah sure. And you? Yes, I was born here, too. Uh, where'd you go to school? Well, we lived in Brooklyn at that time and uh, went to uh, Brooklyn Prep Preparatory School, elementary school, of course. And did you get any formal art training? No. Just started drawing? Yes, time. Were you influenced by anything to get you started? No, I just liked to draw, that's all. I do recall one of the first things I think I ever did was a Christmas wreath. Did that in school. Teachers had it very good. Did you do anything for the school newspaper? Oh, they didn't have a newspaper then. This was a small academy, I think, when I went to. But uh, no, no. And when you got out of school, what'd you do? Then I started to look for work. As an artist? As a cartoonist. I'm not an artist, really. <laughs> And so what did you try? Did you try and sell gag pieces? Uh, just... No, I tried to sell strips. Did you, so did you make the round sell the newspapers for, oh, the, for the syndicate? Oh, only to the syndicate, sure, sure. And, where'd you and I wasn't any good, so, uh, you know, at that time. But I finally did locate with the New York Daily News as a sports cartoonist on and off. And uh, that was the beginning of my career, I guess you'd call it. So were you on staff or freelance? No, uh, freelance, yeah. I met Captain Patterson, he was the publisher at that time, and he liked the stuff I was doing, so I put it in the paper. And how did you get in the comic book business? I still don't recall how I met Malcolm Wheeler Nichols. He was the fellow who originated the comic books itself, or the original comic books, I guess you call them. I don't recall how I met him, but in any event I did, and then I met Whit Ellsworth, and the both of us, the three of us, started these books off. Were you involved in just the creative side of putting the books together? Oh, no, everything. The whole business. You go to the printing plant, make well, sure that the yeah, runs were made. Sure. Yeah. Well, I didn't go to the plant, but you know, took care of that. Who set the pricing structures and all those things when you first started? I don't know really. It sort of would be ten dollars a page, then it went up to fifteen, then twenty-five, and things of that sort. And how'd they set your salary? Did you tell them you were really good? Uh, <laughs> I tried to convince them, but uh, now they they came through with a few raises when I was up there. Yeah. The only thing I didn't take care of was financing. That was Nicholson's job, and he, he did a terrible job. <laughs> well, I would assume that if you're in the office, and he's the front man running all over the place, you must have found out everything that was going on. I in certainly business. did. <laughs> it was fun, though. A lot of fun. How long was Nicholson around before he got, he got bought out, right? Yeah. I would say probably uh, three or four years, somewhere about that. What were the first books you guys put together? Well, I think it was fun. New fun. New fun. Fun comics. And then we had new comics, I think. Which became Adventure. Yeah. And how did you get distribution in those days? Well, through the, this uh, firm that eventually took Nicholson over, the Independent News Company. They were the distributors. Uh, Harry Donofield came uh, through. Yes. I, the only thing that's a little uh, annoying when he says the DC comics is Donofield comics, you know, the DC emblem. Not detective comics. But that's where it came from, is detective comics, isn't it? Oh, sure. Yeah. Sure, there's no Donofield comics. And what was National Periodicals? Well, that was the, the company before. It was just the previous company with change of names, that's all. And so when did Craig Flessel show up? He, he probably came into the office. We had offices on Lexington Avenue in New York. Did you have staff artists and staff writers? A couple of did some work in the office. The rest were freelance and would come bring this work in. Did you reprint stuff at first, or did you end up doing a mixture of original and reprints? Most of it was original, I think. Did you have a tough time finding artists who would do strips for you? Oh, no, they'd be happy to have this stuff in them. You know, it wasn't very good stuff. Or it started them off. It must have been interesting for them to do oh, yeah. stories as opposed to strips. Was Bob Kane around in those days? Uh, a little later on, when I went uptown to the, the new office that Donnerfell had purchased. Did any of them stay with the business very long? Uh, some did, yeah. They grew up with the thing. And now, the interesting thing is, you know, you look at the covers, and the covers, particularly on Adventure, you know, they started out being humorous, and then they started to get more uh, serious in terms of their... It was supposed to be like Adventure, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> did you look at the pulps and see how they were selling and see what was popular no. for them, or did you just decide, this is going to be good for us? No. no. There were some artists in the pulps that were quite good, and I may have used some of those fellows. Contact yeah. them, I don't remember. I was going to say, there's a guy named Omelia who did a... Oh, Leo Omelia. Yeah, he did quite a few nice, really nice looking yeah. covers. Yeah, Leo, Leo was quite good, yeah. And he became a sports cartoonist, by the way. How'd really? you find him? They would come in, you know, at the office. Did you place ads to look for... Uh, Not particularly, guys? no. Yeah. The word gets around very quickly. In a city like New York, where you have starving artists... There's a place to go get a job. <laughs> well, when you started and you were an artist, did you, were you a little disappointed that you couldn't, that you ended up becoming editor and, and taking no, all just responsibilities? No, I just took it in course of things, you know, that uh, if this is the way it was supposed to be, uh, what, that's it. Now, did you stop drawing covers because you didn't want to draw anymore or because you didn't have the time? I didn't have the talent. 
That's <laughs> sick. I was not. I, I mean, you weren't. And the, co the covers were mostly, uh, as you indicated, that they were straight covers. They, they dramatic and all that. I'm not good at that. I can draw cartoons. Well, the cartoon stuff looks great well, too. Yeah. Cartoon sells, right? Oh yeah, yeah. And I think sometimes it's better in car or caricature. I put it that way. Yeah. Caricatures are much better sometimes than photos or drawings. Yeah, and they're tougher to do in some oh, cases, yeah, too, sure. to make them look... To make sell. them look like the people. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I did concoct a strip with Jimmy Durante. So he and I were partners. I sold it to the Bell Newspaper Syndicate, but they couldn't get enough papers to meet his uh, guarantee or whatever he required, so we just couldn't get going. Did he write this stuff? Oh, he didn't do anything, no. no. He, he, just, he was the merchant... He, was he put his name on it. No, I, I wrote it and drew the contract. You were basically there at the beginning of a business, yeah. well, particularly yeah. for DC Comics. Yeah. Uh, well, I would say that uh, I have been uh, sort of mentioning the fact that I'm a founder of the industry. Well, one of the founders, not the founder. Oh, a founder of the comic book business. And how was it like having Malcolm Wheeler? Well, he was quite a character. Where did he come from? What was his business before? He the had, uh, uh, no, he had been in the Army. He was Mal Major Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson. Hyphenated name. He was not British, was he? Oh, no, no. Is he? I think he thought he was British. And he married uh, some gal he met in Europe, I think, on top of the Eiffel Tower or somewhere up in there. <laughs> but he was, he was quite a character. He had a beaver hat and carried a cane, wore spats occasionally. But I was always uh, amused at the hyphenated name, the Malcolm Wheel Nicholson. I've seen it a lot in Brits, but I've never seen it in Americans. Yeah. But he sold the business. What else did, did, did he go into? That was, then he disappeared as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, right. I don't know where he went. When Malcolm Wheeler left, yeah. did things change enough so that it was time for you to go? or did you? I went along with Donatfeld's company at that time. Donatfeld bought Nicholson out, and I just went along. They didn't know anything about comic books or anything of that side. But they had the distribution? Well, they had the distribution, and they had a little bit of cash which was necessary. Always good. <laughs> Got to pay the printer. Sure. Did you ever deal with the Donnerfelds other than... Uh... Leibowitz was the fellow I used to deal with. And how was Jack? Jack was quite old now. He's older than I am. Jack... Still goes in the Rockefeller Center, you know. I spoke with him about uh, a month or so ago. How's he doing? Sort of feeble, I guess. He, he asked me to come in. I said I'd... Every Tuesday, he says he goes in. Yeah. I said I'd like to 97 years old. Yeah. But what else would stay there? He came back. He was engaged to a girl by the name of Jane Dewey, I think. And they both went out to the West Coast. So I was To there. go to Hollywood. Hollywood, yeah. She was an actress, or presumably an actress. So uh, he left, and uh, it was just, I was the one carrying the thing on, I guess. And it was getting to be a bit much. Uh, well, yeah. So he came back. Well, he came back after I left. They, they, they needed somebody who was who knew the business, so he knew it, and they called him back, I guess. <laughs> he stayed there for quite some time. Uh, he did end up going back to Los to Hollywood, you know. Yeah, I know. Uh, when the Superman series got made in the fifties, yeah. uh, he went out there, I think, permanently and became their technical advisor on the show. Yeah, tried to get Superboy off the ground as well. I always remember seeing his name, Wood Ellsworth, producer. I think it was the producer. Or something. Exactly. I always wondered what he did on the show. <laughs> got paid, obviously. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when Siegel and Schuster came in from Cleveland, I mean, was it? Well, it must have been a pretty big deal just to take the leap of faith that they were going to have a job and come to come to New York City in those days, was it? Oh, sure. Yeah. Practically, penniless kids coming in from <laughs> Cleveland. Obviously, made the choice to finally pick up the Superman strip for action. Prior to that, they had quite a number of features that were used in new comics or fun comics. That's how I met them. They came out from Cleveland and brought the stuff in, and it looked pretty good. And when you saw the Superman stuff, what did you think? Oh, I thought it was a novel idea. So. Enough to be able to put on the cover every other issue. Oh, yeah. Well, well, we waited maybe two or three issues to find out how the thing was doing, of course. But. And then Bob King came in uh, shortly after that, and he spoke to me about these two fellows who are making $1,500 a week, you know. And when I said, why don't you do the same thing, you know, come in <laughs> with a character, and he did the next day, or not the next day, next week, I think it was. He brought in Batman. Did okay for himself. Yeah, he did okay, right. Everybody did okay with Batman, I think. Yeah, that's true. Still yeah. still doing okay, apparently. And how long did you work there before you started your own company? Three or four years, I think. Well, I decided to publish because I could see there was money in it. Right. So I put together a little bit of cash and uh, got together the ingredients for, for publishing and uh, set off. What year? 40s, I think, yeah. yeah. Was it, uh, it was after just the war it started? No, it was prior to the war. Then I was approached by Charlie McAdam, 
who, who was the head of McNaught Syndicate, he and a friend of his, Frank Markey, wanted to get out some comic books. They had Joe Peluca and uh, all of these, Mickey Finn, Dixie Dugan. So I started to go along with them, so I did. But you had a better vested interest in that. Oh, yeah. yeah. I wasn't very happy with the way that business was conducted at the Donutville organization. Yeah, when you start at the beginning, you expect to be treated pretty well. Yeah. Because you helped build the business, obviously. Yeah. So you got, you didn't have to worry about paper shortages yet? Oh, no, not at that time, no, but then I did later on. And you'd already had an allocation, obviously. Uh, yeah, not too large, but uh, I'd have to go out and buy paper or buy companies to it. That had the allocation. And uh, that uh, Marine, U.S. Marines is one of the books that I think I brought out just prior to the war. Maybe the war had started, I don't know. To make something out of nothing is a pretty interesting yeah, work. Yeah, yeah. And these things all went around the world, really. I was selling books in Mexico and Australia. Really? England. Oh, sure. I'd make the deal with the uh, publisher, mm -hmm. like the Amalgamated Press in, in London. I don't know whether they're still in existence or not. I think Amalgamated is, actually. Yeah. Did you, uh, did you ever go see them and, and make deals oh, yeah. and check out your, oh, how sure. their stuff was being published? Sure. As a matter of fact, I couldn't get my money out of the, country, uh, the countries at that time, so they you know, it accumulated, and I would uh, fly over, use the money, have a vacation. Oh, yeah, yeah. Went to France and South of France and all that. Italy. That's right. They used to freeze funds up yeah, all the yeah. way up to the, to the late 50s, as a matter yeah. of fact. Even Australia. I would send a, a material down there, and they'd, they would buy a, an airline ticket for me down there and then transfer it up here. The, the company that you started? Magazine Enterprise, yeah. I mean, Well, that continued for quite some time. And then the, uh, they started to crack down on the comics because they, they, bad influence on the kids and all that sort of stuff. Television came along. That was the thing that killed it. Killed the whole business, right? You think so? Oh, I think so. Yeah. Do you think it's just because another entertainment medium cut into... Well, they, they, the kids didn't have to pay 10 cents for the books. They were getting it for nothing on television, and that it was action. It was a whole new media, you might say. So you think it, radio, obviously, was just audio, but... Yeah. The visuals. Well, the radio helped me, of course. I had the I made a deal with the uh, National Biscuit Company to bring out Straight Arrow. That was the first Indian hero. Well, and White Indian was plenty of White, White Indian. Indian yeah. Through the course of ME, how did you find your talent? Did you specifically look after some people, or uh, how did you assign strips to individual artists? Well, I had an editor, and I had a staff. And uh, Ray Crank was my editor. I had a few girls around that did artwork and things. That's how uh, Ray took care of most of the editorial end at that time. And how was the business end? Well, the business end. Right? Well, if Donenfeld had IND, what did you, how did you get your distribution? Well, through the Ameri uh, there were several distributing companies. One of the best was the American News Company, and I landed with them. And I think prior to that, it was with the Street and McCall or some name like that. They were distributed to the McCall magazine. Did you publish anything other than comic books when you were there? Occasional uh, promotional things of that nature. Plymouth Motor Car Company, we did a book for them. and. Uh, Little Miss Sunbeam, that's a bakery, I think, a national bakery. They mm -hmm. did books for that. And so who put those deals together? Was that stuff that you did? Well, I, well, I yeah, my organization did that. Huh? And do you think that all early experience, realizing where the business was and what it was going to happen, gave you a step up on the business as opposed to a lot of the other guys who weren't around? I mean, starting in 1935, most of these guys didn't even start the business until 39, 40, 41, when it started to actually... Yeah, hey, but the whole thing sort of collapsed in the, in the 40s, late 40s. What would you do? <laughs> I went out and I uh, uh, started a food company, Popeye Peanut Butter, which didn't last very long. That's a tough business, real tough. Did you keep in touch with any of the people that you worked with throughout the, the time you were in the business before you, you know, up through the mid-50s? Craig, of course, I know he lives on the island here. Yeah. Yeah. What did you like about the old days? Anything in particular? Well, uh, looking back, in retrospect, it's, uh, it was quite interesting. No one really had any experience. That's <laughs> right. You kind of make it up as you go along? Yes, and I'm, so, I'm amazed that the people would buy the stuff they, they bought at that time. Not the people, I guess, the kids. Can you sing? I can sing a little bit. I love music. Do you? Yeah. I like to play the piano. I never could play it. I could play it by, by ear. Can yeah, you, I can sing a little bit. Can you bit. tell a poem? I bet you, you're Irish. You've got to be able to sing. 